I just want to say we're so lucky to have you here today, Carol, and to share your top tips for storytelling with young learners. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, for that lovely introduction. And it's wonderful to see so many of you here this afternoon, this evening, and from so many different places all over the world. And I hope you're all sitting relaxed and comfortably with a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, maybe a festive glass, or maybe a cup of hot chocolate <laughs> if it's near bedtime for you. Okay, for this relaxed session on storytelling with young children. And I'd like to thank Macmillan very much for organizing um, this winter event. It's, it's wonderful to have this chance to get together at the end of what has been an incredibly difficult um, year. And you know something, years ago, when I was a young teacher, so many, many years ago, starting out, an older colleague said to me once, she said, you know, Carol, I think that if the only thing we ever did with children was tell them stories, they would learn English. And of course, I can't prove that with any kind of research evidence, but in a way, I've always believed it. And I'd like to start off this session by talking about some of the reasons why storytelling is such a powerful vehicle for learning. We'll then sample a story and some related activities. We'll discuss key principles in the storytelling process, and I'll share my eight top tips. I'm planning not to use PowerPoint for most of this session, but don't worry, because at the end, I will give you a summary of the key points. I think it's helpful to think of the reasons for storytelling in relation to six areas. The learners themselves, the skills that stories develop, the structure of stories, the content of stories, and last but not least, social and emotional learning. Let me elaborate on that a little bit, and please, I'd love to see your ideas in the chat box as I do this, because I'm just going to give you some examples, and there are lots of other things as well. In terms of language, stories provide a meaningful context for comprehensible input through, for example, visuals, mime, gesture, facial expression, voice and they can be used to introduce or to recycle vocabulary and language structures. And they provide a transition from receptive understanding to production and using language. In terms of the learners themselves, stories provide a very important link between home and school because children are mostly familiar with stories in a home context. And so it's something familiar for them when they also have stories at school. They also provide a link between fantasy, imagination, and the child's real world. Stories are a collective activity, a shared social experience, and they build a sense of community. In the words of Van Leer, during a story, everyone is intersubjectively engaged. In other words, focused on the same thing. Stories also provide opportunities for the active construction of personally significant meaning. Different children take different things from the stories. And related to that, stories cater for diversity among children, that everyone can be successful at their own level. And this, as we know, is really important with very young children who are going to be at different stages of development, um, whatever their age. In terms of skills, stories provide for the integration of oral and aural skills, and with older learners, of course, reading and writing as well. They develop very important thinking skills, prediction, hypothesizing, sequencing, 
problem solving, creative and critical thinking. And with young children, they also develop attention and concentration skills, something that we value very much when we're working with very small children. In terms of the structure of stories, children are usually familiar with stories and narrative conventions in their mother tongue, and they have a familiar structure that children know, although they wouldn't be able to articulate it, that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's always some kind of problem in a story, a conflict, and a resolution at the end. And stories also have discourse patterns, such as repetitive or cumulative, where things get added, which promote the acquisition of language. In terms of stories, the content often links to other areas of the curriculum or perhaps provides an implicit introduction into the target language culture. Stories also very often allow for the exploration of important and relevant issues for children, such as not wanting to go to bed, being scared of the dark, not wanting to eat vegetables, but in a safe and not threatening way because you're always doing it through fictional characters rather than yourself. And stories, of course, are motivating, memorable, they're pleasurable, and they inspire children to want to join in and use language. And lastly, in terms of social and emotional learning, stories, for example, um, develop children's ability to see things from other points of view and to develop empathy, skills of empathy. And of course, very often, stories embed positive values such as kindness or helping others or sharing and respect for diversity. And this is something that we can work on over the long term with our children as well. So let's now have a look at a story and some related activities that we might do with very young children. And as I show you these and talk about them and demonstrate them, please, I'd love you to note in the chat box anything that you notice that you think will help to make the story engaging and to help children understand and remember the story. So the story we're going to look at is actually by food. And we might decide to um, recycle or remind children of some of the vocabulary before we begin. And let's just have a look at three simple ways we might do that using flashcards. So to start off, the first one, I'm going to show you a flashcard. Can you see it there coming at the bottom of your screen? And as soon as you can see what it is, I want you to put the word in the chat box. Are you ready? So what food is this? Can you see? Can you see? And bananas, lovely. Okay, so bananas in the story. Let's just do one more like that. Are you ready? Looking carefully. This one's quite tricky, actually. Can you tell me what it is? What is it? Carrots. Okay, so there are carrots in the story. And let's have a look at a different way of doing this called, I'm going to call it flip. Okay, so flip. Are you ready? Mustn't get the light there. Are you ready to tell me what this is? And it's ice cream. Fantastic. And what about this one? We'll try the other side. Maybe may work better with the light for you. Are you ready? Are you ready to tell me? E eggs. Fantastic. Eggs. Okay. I actually said it before you did, but never mind. Okay. And um, the last ones, we'll use another um, flashcard technique, this slow reveal. Are you ready to tell me what food's in the story? Can you see that? Your prediction skills? It's pear, pears, a very good guess. Actually, yes, um, apples. Fantastic. So apples in the story. And the last one we're going to do, because we're not looking at all the food items, but just to um, give some examples. And this one, 
Are you ready to tell me what it is? That looks weird, doesn't it? What's that? Strawberries, apple, orange? Good guess. No, bread. Someone's put it already. Fantastic. Okay, so bread. Okay, so we might um, do a bit of revision about uh, uh, of the um, vocabulary that's going to be um, in the story. And then we might use our puppet to um, introduce the story. So I'm going to use this puppet here. Okay, this is, this is Mimi. Um, Mimi is actually a meerkat, but you don't have to use Mimi. You can use any puppet at all. You can use an oven glove. You can use an old sock. You can use, I've got hundreds of puppets that I've used over the years. Um, but our puppet can help us introduce the story. Okay, okay, Mimi, just hang on a sec there. Hang on. Okay. What's that? Okay. Mimi wants to know if you want a story. Do you want a story? You better say yes. <laughs> okay. Mimi wants... What's that, Mimi? What's that, Mimi? The, the story's about shopping. Are you sure that's going to be a very interesting shopping? Yeah. It, Mimi thinks it's a a funny story. Okay, remember, it's a funny story. It's four-year-old humour. Remember, okay. Mimi says the story is about her, so it's about Mimi and her brother Dylan and Daddy, and they go to the supermarket shopping for food. And Mimi wants to know, do you like shopping? Do you like shopping? Yes? No? Sometimes, okay, that's a good idea, Mimi, that's a very good idea. Mimi wants to know, can you guess what they buy um, in the story? Can you guess what they buy in the story? What food do they buy? Let's see your ideas in the chat box, okay? Yeah, they've got lots of ideas, haven't they, Mimi? Okay, now, yes, Mimi, you're quite right. Let's listen to the story. So are you ready for the story then? I want you to listen and tell me what they buy um, in the story. Okay, so are you ready? So Daddy, Mimi and Dylan are in the kitchen. Okay, and look, Mimi, D Dylan's got his drum. Do, 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 do. And Daddy is sitting at the table and he's writing a shopping list. Hmm, eggs, hmm, apples, hmm, carrots. What else? Mm, cereal, bananas, milk. And Dylan goes with his drum, eggs and apples and carrots and cereal, bananas, milk. And eggs and apples and carrots and cereal, bananas, milk. Oh, Dylan, you are funny, says Mimi. Stop, says Daddy. Shh, come on, let's go. Oh, says Dylan, I don't like shopping. Mimi, Daddy and Dylan go to the supermarket. Oh, no says Daddy. Oh no, where's the shopping list? Don't worry, Daddy, I can help, says Dylan. I can help too, says Mimi. Egg! Very good, says Daddy. Put the eggs in the trolley. Do, 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 do. Eggs, apples, apples. Very good, Mimi. 
put the apples in the trolley and ice cream ice cream no dylan ice cream isn't on the list today oh i like ice cream do 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 eggs and apples and carrots very good dylan put the carrots in the trolley eggs and apples and carrots and cereal very good mimi put the cereal in the trolley and ice cream no dylan ice cream isn't on the shopping list oh i like ice cream do 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 eggs and apples and carrots and cereal and bananas very good dylan put the bananas in the trolley do 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 eggs and apples and carrots and cereal bananas milk very good mimi put the milk in the trolley and ice cream no dylan ice cream isn't on the list oh i like ice cream do you think they buy ice cream what do you think do they buy ice cream or not let's find out oh look says daddy here's the shopping list silly me hmm let's see eggs yes apples yes carrots yes cereal yes bananas yes milk yes and ice cream says dylan no dylan ice cream isn't on the shopping list mm. well maybe you and mimi are my little helpers ice cream is on the shopping list today let's have a treat oh thank you daddy says mimi i like ice cream oh thank you daddy i like ice cream too and i like shopping okay so that's the end of our little story and i see lots of ideas coming in the chat box there fantastic that's really good so what we might do um after our story is actually we might use our puppet again to um check the answers so we would ask um the children so what food do they buy and we might say well can you remember dylan's chant and actually we might use different percussion, different percussion that we've got um, to do the chant together. Can you remember Dylan's chant? And it goes, you can all do it at home if you like, eggs and apples and carrots and cereal, bananas, milk. And eggs and apples and carrots and cereal, bananas, milk. Fantastic. And, and me, okay, yeah, Mimi. Mimi wants to know, who do you think is funny in the story. Dylan, Dylan's funny. Well, you're quite funny too, but Dylan, Dylan is funny in the story. And, and, and 
Who in the story says silly me? Who says silly me in the story? <laughs> I know it's daddy. That's very funny, isn't it? He says silly me. And what's that? Who likes ice cream in the story? Who likes ice cream? Dylan, yes, and you like ice cream too, don't you, Mimi? You like you like ice cream. And who helps in the story? Dylan and and you, yes, Mimi, of course, you help too. So we would also want to move on to some personalization. Do you like the story? Do you help your mum and dad when you go shopping? What's your favorite treat? And other activities that we might do over several lessons, because we're going to come back to the story more than once, we might, for example, do an activity where we guess what's in Mimi's shopping bag. So we could get children to come out to the front, to take an object, to feel it, to guess what it is. And then we say to everyone else, are they right? Is she right? Yes, it's an apple or another one, the child comes and feels, and they say, I think it's a banana. And yes, it's a banana. We might also act out the story in groups. We could have a Mimi group and a Dylan group at this age group. And also, of course, we might invent with the children a creative version of the story using a, di a different shopping list, different food, and a different chant. And actually, if any of you are thinking now, I'd really like to use this story. I don't have the story cards. I don't have the puppet. I would like to suggest that you adapt the story to a, a Christmas context, if you're celebrating Christmas, with different characters. You can either draw pictures um, on a whiteboard or on, on, the, on, um, on, on the board, or you can use flashcards that you have from somewhere else, elicit the names from the children, and make it a Christmas shopping expedition, okay, with a Christmas chant. So our Christmas chant might go, card and tree and toys and candle and presents and cake, for example. Um, so we can use this story as a basis for creating our own creative versions. And you don't need to worry if you don't have, have, happen to have all these materials. The story can also be a springboard into um, values education. Um, for example, in this story, the value of helping into content-based learning, for example, categorizing food that grows in the garden. And we might also relate the story to um, a, a cultural rhyme related to food. And you might try this now. It develops motor skills and it also develops cooperative skills. You do it in pairs. So if you're watching this with a friend, you can do this together. And we go, peas, pudding, hot, peas, pudding, cold. Peas pudding on a plate, hot or cold. OK, so an example then of some things that we can do with stories. And there are some principles that I think are really important. First of all, that the storytelling process is cyclical. We're going to come back to the story two or three times during a unit of work. And the children are going to move from global understanding of the story through to acting it out. And during this process, we draw the children into using language. And we do this by scaffolding their responses from their mother tongue or shared language initially into English. And the more the children hear the story, the more they're likely to participate and contribute um, in English. Another important principle, which I think I already mentioned, diversity, that everyone can participate successfully at the level at which they're ready to do so. And we mustn't be judgmental about that. 
children are developing in different ways at different stages. Some children may just repeat some of the vocabulary, even only one of the words, or even the kind of intonation of Dylan. Oh, children are always very good at that kind of um, intonation, but they're participating successfully in the way that is appropriate for them at that moment. Another important principle to do with variety. It's one thing when you're at home to retell a story again and again in the same way to children. But in an educational setting, in a classroom, children don't want to do the same thing again. So a key principle is always to do something different with the story. For example, you might use the audio or the animated version. You might get children to hold up picture cards of food. They might move cut out characters of Mimi and Dylan and Daddy um, as they speak um, in the story. Or we might do an action. We might get children to wave their arms or jump in the air every time they hear a food word. Another important principle is that the story that we um, are exposed to in the story, we want to transfer to other contexts. So, for example, children categorize the food, um, food that grows in the garden and food that doesn't, or they talk about food that they like or don't like. So the story provides the context for meaningful and memorable understanding of the language, but then we transfer using it to other, con other contexts. And the last principle here is to do with personalization. And as I like to say, we need to give our children choice and voice. They need to be active participants in the learning process. So for example, here, they might be role play. I've seen that's lovely. Yes, absolutely. And making their own shopping list, um, drawing their own favorite um, treat, um, and so on. So actually, many stories are available in audio recordings or animated videos. And that, that's wonderful for us to have as a resource. I mean, the story I've just done with you is available in that way. And these have the advantage of engaging children with realistic sound effects, accompanying music, and a variety of voices for the different characters. However, the disadvantage is the absence of a real storyteller that children can see and I would argue it's often just as good or actually even better to tell the story to the children yourself, at least in the first instance. And this turns the storytelling into a shared social event and not only creates a sense of immediacy and involvement on the part of the children, but also enables you to support children's understanding and involve them in participating in the story as you tell it. And the following that I'd like to share with you are my eight top tips for storytelling with young children. The first tip, very important, be yourself. There are as many different ways of telling a story as there are teachers. And I think it's really important that you don't try and force things or try and do anything that doesn't come naturally to you. You know, children, even very young children, they pick it up. If you don't feel comfortable with what you're doing, they'll get onto it. So tell it as you. And some people tell stories in a very quiet way. Other people, you know, leap about and act them out and just do what comes naturally to you. And another really important thing is don't worry or even think twice about your accent. We all have different accents. We come from different regions of the UK, different Anglo-speaking countries. And 
as Mark Hancock, I was really happy to read this in a recent blog. And he says, actually, he says, and I'm quoting, if a teacher is competent and intelligible, it doesn't matter what their accent is. And I've often met teachers who've said, well, actually, I don't like to tell it myself because I feel there's a better model um, in the recording, in the audio. But actually, the advantage of that is, is nothing as compared to the advantages of you connecting with the children and telling the story yourself. But at the same time, we do need to make sure that we're familiar with the story and also practice telling it before you go into class um, in front of a mirror or, for example, using Zoom or a selfie you know, video um, and possibly at this time of year accompanied by a seasonal um, glass of wine. But even then, it's difficult to do. I mean, I find um, talking to you now on the screen that it is like a kind of mirror image and it's a kind of brain thing to, to, to hold the cards right and to point in the right place um, when you're doing it online, which is why actually what I like to do um, if I'm teaching online is to make a recording of myself doing the story that I can then work with um, with the children. So that first point then, very important, um, be yourself. Second tip, make storytelling into a pleasant ritual. Something that I get children to do if they're sitting on the carpet is to take their index finger and draw a magic circle around the place where they're sitting. And that is their personal space. And they must stay in it during the story. And they're not allowed into another child's space. And another child's space is not allowed into theirs. And this avoids all the kind of nudging and touching and distractions during the storytelling. Another good idea is to actually signal the storytelling with a story rhyme. So for example, just very simply, it's time for a story. One, two, three. Are you ready? Listen to me. The next tip, tip number three, get interest, attention, and curiosity. Use your puppet. Personalize by asking children questions that relate to the story and their own lives. Ask prediction questions. Ask focus questions so they have something to think about as they listen to the story. Tip number four, make the most of your voice, your eyes, and your body. Use your voice slowly and clearly, not unnaturally slowly, but yes, slowly articulate, a bit like the way parents talk to very young children. So slowly and clearly use intonation, use characterization for different voices, vary your pitch, your tone, your um, your pitch, your your pitch and your tone and your speed. Um, use use your. Um, sorry, I keep getting a message here, and um, it's I'm finding it quite off-putting. But I'm. Um, I think this is Will trying to get in touch with me. I hope there's not a problem. I'm on course for finishing soon. Is that what you're worried about? Okay. Um, so use your eyes. You can say anything with your eyes. You can look happy, you can look sad, you can look surprised, you can look angry. And it's also really important to um, make contact with the children as you tell the story. And also use your body, use mime and gesture, facial expression, pointing to the pictures, um, and so on. Tip number five, involve and engage children. Ask questions, sure, to check understanding, um, to predict what happens, but don't ask too many questions, as this really breaks up the rhythm of the story and actually turns the story into a language practice activity and kills the magic. And 
elicit words and pause and get children to join in, especially when there are repetitive words and phrases and chunks in the story. Tip number six, feel free with the story text. Now, there are some people who may not agree with me about this, but I think we have to do what comes naturally to us when we're telling the story and connecting with the children and seeing how far they're understanding or not. So we want to be able to repeat and go back over things as often as we need to and add words or phrases if it feels right. For example, I know I often say things like, says Mimi, when I'm telling the story myself because I point to the character in the picture or add things like, look, Dylan's got a drum because I want to make the connection between Dylan making up that silly and annoying chant, which actually helps Daddy manage to do the shopping in the end. Tip number seven, be sensitive to the children's responses. Give time to look, comment, ask questions in their shared language. Um, they're unlikely to be able to do it in English. Remember, this is, this is a very simple story. You've seen it before. It's the first time for the children and it's in another language. So give time for that and be ready to recast and expand um, children's contributions and relate the story to the children themselves, to their experiences and if they experienced anything similar and if appropriate we can ask them what we can learn from the story. So give children choice and voice. And my last tip, eight, tip number eight, which is perhaps in a way the most important, and that is show and share your own enjoyment of the story. It's catching. Okay, so that kind of brings me to the end, but I'd just like to, if we can see the PowerPoint now, show you a summary of um, the points. There they are, that, that's the first. If you remember, we started off the session by looking at reasons for storytelling, and I related them to these um, six areas that you have up there. I think it's a useful way of thinking about the benefits of storytelling. We then, of course, looked at some practical examples, and I talked about six key principles related to the storytelling process, and you've got them up there in um, winter Winterfair snowflakes, you can see them there, the six principles. And finally, and please do take screenshots of this, or I think you'll be getting the PowerPoints later. Anyway, um, here are my um, top eight tips for, eight top tips rather, for um, storytelling with very young children. So that brings me to the end of my contribution to this winter fair. And I think we're going to have a chat now with Louise and Gregor. And I will answer any questions um, you would like to ask me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Carol. Uh, one question that came relatively late, but I think it's very interesting. Um, and I'll quote it for you, is that Montessori uh, argues that children under seven should not be presented to fictional characters such as you know talking meerkats uh, as they are not cognitively ready to separate fantasy from real life would you like to comment on that please well i think i think that's very interesting and it's very lovely to get a question from someone who is familiar with the work of such key maria, educators yeah. as maria montessori and i think um i think that actually that kind of fine line between fantasy and reality, that children do quickly realize that the mercats aren't, the mercats are fantasy. Okay, so the, they, they are fantasy, but the situation they're in is a very real situation, one that children can relate to all children, you know, are going to have gone shopping with their parents or carers um, at some point. And I think that um, people would argue these days that actually 
children do have the cognitive ability to kind of to separate separate those out in a way that is that is important and that fantasy can actually um the fantasy side of it can help them to develop their imaginations to understand specific concepts um and so on i mean it is true one of the reasons that children relate so passionately to a class puppet is because they invest that reality in the puppet but i wouldn't say that that is a reason not to use fantasy and imaginative characters with young children in fact i would argue that um that is a very sort of important part of um children's overall overall development but thank you very much for that question it's it's a, it's a, it's a good it's a good point to have brought up about montessori yeah thank you thank you carol um there were lots of comments carol about yes. um, yeah. um but what what came up a, a lot was um thank you for sort of saying to us that we can be ourselves and be natural and use our own tone of voice and you know as you said some of us speak louder than others or more um extroverts and some are more introverts and i think that's a wonderful thing because if this as you say is a shared experience and people all those people the ki the children and the teacher sharing that ex experience together should be themselves and exactly. i think that, that's so important and, yes. and thank you for pointing that out i uh, i think it's really important for sorry i was going to say i mean i think it's important for anything that we do in teaching you know and young yes. children are actually very astute and they notice if you're not feeling comfortable about it and i've heard stories told in many many different ways you know i've heard stories told in a context where you know people are leaping about and acting on the stage yes. and other stories where someone you know is speaking perhaps so quietly that you have to be really quiet yourself in order to hear the story and both those ways of storytelling are very very powerful and so i think you have to find your own voice as a storyteller yes. and in keeping with your own personality because somebody else did um write a comment that um you know stories do take a lot of energy and they do. you know um and and so maybe we need to stop thinking about you know being the extrovert and and but rather be ourselves we do need to invest some time in practicing beforehand and preparing it but it doesn't require changing your personality and exactly. and therefore being Uh, exactly very one other demanding. set of comments which perhaps we'll just manage to squeeze in uh, yeah. what about uh, you know that the kind of predictably about doing this in front of a large class whether mm -hmm. online or offline 25 plus uh, children in a classroom would you have any tips here carol um online or offline i mean but, but the, i think there were questions about both but i mean large classes uh, i think is the key thing if you have a large class of 25 plus children uh will it still work uh, or if it needs adaptation would you recommend any any uh, no, I strategies think story, i i think the storytelling itself the storytelling itself is very much a whole class activity okay. so i actually think um what's really important is that interest attention and curiosity at the beginning um and i also think um that you need to i mean one of the things you know in terms of management of the children that actually don't get diverted that that's okay. really really important as you're telling mm. the story don't you know there may be one or two children who are not concentrating in the way that you hope and it's very the natural thing for the teacher to do is to focus on those children listen to the story and then you come out of the role of storyteller but actually normally the majority of the class want the story and so 
the, the ideal thing to do is for you to carry on, to carry on involving the children. And in my experience, what happens is the children themselves in their own language say, be quiet, so and so and so and so, whatever, okay. because yeah. they, they want because they want to um, uh -huh. because so so exactly. actually this is so it's 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 doing the storytelling by influence rather than by control i mean if you're going you know be quiet juan stop you know mm -hmm. that that's no fun that's no fun no. for anyone so it's actually through the way that you engage children through all the ways, you know, your puppet, you're asking questions, um, not too many questions, because children are very quick to realize if you as teacher are exploiting a story, really, because you want to practice, you know, some bit of language, you know, what's this? It's a banana. What color is it? It's yellow. You know, that, that quickly um, turns you know, the children realize that you lose the magic. You've got uh -huh. to keep the magic. I love That's this. Manage them by yes. influence and not by control. What by, a beautiful yes. one to take away. I, 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 I think the same. Yes, beautiful. that really struck me. Really good. Thanks really important. That. Yeah, point beautiful to note to finish good. off with. Yeah. Uh huh. That's why well, you finish, that, Louise. I, yes, I'd say that for all finish, learners yes. as well, by the way. No, I'd I agree that, with I'd you. I'd say that for primary yes. and, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Carol. It's it's, it's been a real pleasure. Wonderful Thank you for sharing Thank this so much. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We should be ready to our glasses <laughs> now. No. Where's my well, champagne yeah. glass? <laughs> and thank you, thank you to all the people who've been here. Um, it's been really lovely to see so many of you, and from so many places all over the world. It really is very moving to see. It um, is. And also, those of you who are sort of, you know way past your bedtime you know i hope you're not going to go dreaming of shopping lists <laughs>